publicity works so welcome to people who have not been before um it's a series of talks that we put on before but i see home games once a month and this month i'm delighted to introduce her beyond to you because we've been trying to get her for a while now but so she's a big norwich city fan and she lives in london um so juggling around fixtures and she's given up uh, stoke city away today to be here so congratulations <laughs> thank you my pleasure <laughs> we'll see um it's interesting what this talk has brought a lot of memories about in my lifetime Bradford City might have left Bally Parade once in the 1980s after the fire of course and then I remember talking to Jeffrey Richmond in the early 1990s and he was talking about he was considering a move just before he began to develop the ground in order to the promotion to the Premier League I've got room those halcyon days and I said to him basically I'd leave a car bomb outside his house if he tried to take us away from the ground so I don't mind express the strong feelings that people have for their home grounds. I think the word home is really important here. Anyway, enough of me. I'll pass it straight to Fionn. Uh, so thank you, David, and thanks for the invite. I'm really glad to be able to be here. Um, so yeah, this, this is kind of this is a, a PhD thesis I did uh, about five years ago at uh, University of Central Lancashire, uh, and I sort of haven't looked at it for five years, but this is one sort of chapter of it that um, I'm returning to. And uh, yeah, it's how to say goodbye to a football ground. Um, we're going to start in 2016, May 2016. Is that working? Multi-skill. Thank you. Well done, <laughs> So, May 2016, uh, West Ham's. Upton Park, or the Berlin Ground, whichever you call it, they, they can't seem to decide themselves. Um, and this was yeah, there, the, the last game there, uh, having been there since 1904. Uh, and some of you may be familiar with this because it was broadcast live on Sky Sports. They beat Man United, uh, I think it meant they qualified for Europe, something like that. Massive game, dramatic win. The kickoff was delayed by 45 minutes because they were throwing bottles at the Man United team coach outside. Um, and then this was what happened after the game. So by this point, it was about 10 o'clock at night. Um, you've got fireworks going off. You've got the players on the pitch being interviewed. You've got black caps driving all over the pitch. Uh, and, uh, yeah, you've got uh, an interesting performance of I'm Forever Blowing Bubbles by the uh, Cockney Rejects. <laughs> and this was all broadcast around uh, the country and the world on Sky Sports. Uh, and what was the reaction? of uh, this full country audience. It was basically, have West Ham died or are they just moving grounds? If you can read those. Uh, my favourite one is, have West Ham died? Hashtag, what the fuck is going on? Um, have West Ham died? So this seems like a funeral on Sky Sports. Have West Ham died and Sky Sports are having a tribute night. I could have posted a lot more of these. There were, there were many, uh, many on Twitter that I found. Uh, and as you can see, it even made national headlines, mercilessly mocked on Twitter <laughs> for their laser show and the former players arriving in black caps. But is this a little bit harsh? Was what West Ham did any different to what a lot of other clubs have done? Because if we look at the number of football league clubs that have moved stadiums, West Ham are obviously up here, 2016. And you can see before them, quite a lot of clubs have moved in the last 30 years. Uh, but if we go back to the start of where you can see it starts ramping up, which would be in 1988, uh, with the move of Scunthorpe to the uh, Lanford Park from the old showground, you can see there's a very long gap of 33 years between that and the previous uh, Football League stadium move, which was South End, 1955. Because uh, essentially what had happened is that by that point, football clubs were established in their home grounds. They'd perhaps been there since the turn of the century or when they were formed or, or within that period. When they needed to develop their stadium, they built a new stand. They just did it piecemeal and that the stadium grows with the club and it has the character that comes with the club and the, the sense of home that many clubs fans feel strongly attached to, which we'll come back to later. 
But after this huge gap, it's Scunthorpe who were the first ones to finally break that run of stadium moves. Uh, and then, as you can see, the, the ramping up from there is obviously linked to the Taylor Report in 1989, uh, following the Hillsborough disaster, which required stadiums in the top two divisions to become all-seater. And so clubs basically had a choice to either redevelop their stadium uh, or move. And the prevailing mood among a lot of clubs was that it made more financial sense to sell the stadium and the land it was on, often very now valuable land, having had a town around it, built up around it, and that, that land is now very valuable, especially if you're a supermarket, for example. Um, so yeah, as you can see, it ramps up from there. But let's let's have a look at Scunthorpe in 1988 and how did they commemorate their final game at the old showground. So this on the left, as you can see, is a cutting from the um, the final match program when they played Exeter. Uh, it's got a list of the uh, ex players they're hoping to welcome back on that day. It says they're going to have some musical entertainment. Uh, the Hatfield Main Colliery Band, and uh, they're also doing commemorative key rings, 60p. So that's that's how Scunthorpe did it. So, musical entertainment, West Ham had that, ex-players certainly had that. Uh, commemorative merchandise, we will definitely come back to that for West Ham, don't worry. But then how did this game go at the old show then? Unfortunately, you can put on whatever party you want, but you can't control the result, and unfortunately a late equaliser meant by... Uh, didn't get promoted in the headline on the paper. It should have been a cakewalk, spoiled the party. So the one thing you can't control is uh, the result, sadly. So that was Scunthorpe. And then we'll jump ahead a couple of years to Walsall. Oh, yes, it is working good. Uh, so this is 1990, Walsall leaving Fellows Park. This is a photo of the final game against Rotherham. Uh, as you can see, the... Uh, the terrace behind the goal is absolutely packed. This was a pretty much a dead rubber game, but the crowd was more than double what it had been for the rest of their games that season. Shows you the, the power of this sort of final game as an event, for getting people to come to the stadium, say their final goodbye to it. Uh, and again, Walsall marked the occasion. They had a jazz band, they had cheerleaders, they had a balloon release, a thousand balloons. Uh, you could pay a pound to have your name printed in the stadium in a big list saying I was there. And uh, if you bought a programme, you also got this certificate saying uh, this is to certify, and then you write your name on, was present at the last Football League match played at Fellows Park. So again, they're commemorating their final game. Uh, and what else? You could pay three pound for a slab of the concrete terrace. You could pay five pound for a square yard of the pitch. Uh, 50 quid for a turnstile. So again, this is an early example of a club recognising the financial benefit, both in things like paying a pound to have your name in the programme and also just selling off the ground to fans because, as we mentioned, they, fans are so committed to their club stadium, they're so attached to it, they will willingly pay however much for a part of that stadium to have a home. Now we'll move on to 1993. Uh, Nineteen ninety-three, another jump forward of three years, and Millwall final game at the Den. How did this one go? Well, Millwall went even further than Scunthorpe and Walsall. Uh, they, for their match program, which this is a scam from, uh, they made it double the size. They charged a fiver for it in nineteen ninety-three. They uh, had several events. Uh, in, all involving extracting money from people. Uh, and this is a list of some of the things you could buy to commemorate the final league game. Uh, so you've got a, a key ring with a replica of the match ticket. You could buy an I Was Here t-shirt. You could buy a Mill for the game was against Bristol Rovers. You could buy a Millwall versus Bristol Rovers scarf. So it may be that the first half and half scarf was at Millwall. I don't know. I've not seen a picture of it, so can't confirm, but unlikely source. Moving further down the page, uh, you could buy a £47, a watercolour of the den. Very noble. Uh, and note what it says on here. Any, any prints not sold by the end of May will be destroyed by the artist in the presence of a Millwall FC official to preserve its limited status. So 
These are rare. <laughs> and finally, a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to buy the carpet that is in the offices at the old den. Uh, and I this, this scan picture hasn't come out great. It's not a great photo, but this appears to be a member of club staff wearing the carpet as a dress. <laughs> and see herself dancing. So again, what an opportunity for Millwall fans to show their commitment to their club and their love of the den. Yeah, all very wholesome, the watercolours, the carpet. How did the game go against Bristol Rovers? Um, two pitch invasions and a demolition of the stadium. <laughs> Uh, of course, of course, they've got some pictures. Um, here's, the, here's the goalposts. Uh, that is a Millwall fan dressed as a lion on the roof. Not the mascot, it's just a fan who turned up dressed like that. And here's the state of the pitch. Um, so other clubs were sort of charging for the square foot. Millwall, you could just go and uh, take it home yourself. Uh, they did actually hold a couple of weeks later a sort of family fun day where you could have a picnic on pitch. Um, so I'm not sure if there was much left of it by that point. But yeah, this is this is how Millwall did it. And the sort of overarching thing was that there was a lot of anger at the club at the stadium being sold. Essentially, the cost the cost to redevelop it um, was so prohibitive, according to the chairman, that they had no choice but to move to the new stadium. And there was a lot of anger about that. So that was all kind of tied into what happened. They may have destroyed it anyway. I don't know. Um, a similar example, if we jump ahead a little bit to 1997, is Brighton at the Goldstone Ground. Another one where fans were had the sort of stadium sort of sold from under them. Uh, and in this case, they didn't actually have a new stadium to go to. They were essentially being made homeless by their board of directors and chairman. Um, and so again, here they, they took ownership themselves of the stadium, essentially. Uh, this, these In the top three, took the clock home. Apparently it was last seen getting on a train at home station, the enormous clock, uh, and bottom right, these lads have got their seats, wooden seats, and their bit of pitch. But you can also see the, the lad on the left there is wearing a commemorative Brighton and Hove Albion Goldstone Ground t-shirt sold by the club. So even when the club was selling the ground from under their fans, there's still these merchandising opportunities. Um, and again, this came in the context of two years of protests and so that was the the anger and yeah taking the ground apart is I think partly a sort of reclamation of ownership of what was being taken from them but across those those three first examples uh you can see that a pattern had started to emerge that despite these being sort of lower division clubs presumably not many staff um certainly no one with the expertise of how you would move a stadium because no one had done it for 33 years um, but they had identified these ways of making money and also commemorating the move um, and also maybe trying to help fans with the transition to the new stadium. Um, if you give the fans a sort of collation, as Millwall have done on the right here, in their even a programme of what there is to be proud of about your club, that will help them ease the transition to the new stadium because you're saying what we're taking with us is all of our history. It's not in the tangible uh, material of the ground, um, even though the fans are taking that with them anyway. Uh, it's in it's in the identity of the club, and and that's how they, they put it all in this package that you can buy and take home with you and keep as a, a souvenir keepsake. But yeah, they they had identified this sort of status of the final game as an event, but no club had yet really pulled this out across the entire season. Uh, it was all kind of really focused on the last game in these examples. Um, and then we come to Huddersfield. So, <laughs> Huddersfield, uh, 1994, they moved from Leeds Road here to what was called at the time the McAlphite Stadium, which you can see in the background. And from that picture, you can see the context in which this is being done. Literally, the ground is being built. They can watch it go up through the season as they prepare for the move. Um, so maybe there's kind of less disruption to the established match day routine when it's that proximity. You can still go to the same pub, you can still park in the same place. Maybe that eases the transition and the apprehension that fans have about the move uh, more than compared to some other examples where you're going way out of town 
to a, an industrial estate or a retail park and you're, you're completely then disconnected from that kind of established routine you have. Uh, it was also quite an exciting stadium design, I think objectively, um, compared to other ones. And the team were doing quite well at the time as well. There was quite an air of positivity around Huddersfield. So unlike uh, Brighton and Millwall, where it was quite negative, uh, there, was, there was quite an optimistic attitude towards it. And what they did at Huddersfield, they had a commercial team uh, led by Paul Fletcher and Alan Stevenson, who used to play together for Burnley in the 1970s. They since moved into working for football clubs. And they established this first kind of concept of branding a stadium move. So you can see at the top, it says the end of an era, it's got a big ribbon badge. And they made this the overarching theme of the season, uh, the end of an era. Uh, so here are some of the things they did, all with the same logo. Uh, so from top left, you've got history brochure. So again, all of this nostalgia of the club's history coming with them. A grand draw, money to be made. Again, a big final program. Uh, you could pay to have your farewell message in the last program. You could 250 quid to pay on the pitch. You could have your guided tours. More limited edition prints. I don't know if they destroyed these ones. Uh, the final whistle is a farewell video. More nostalgia compilation highlights. They had an auction, bits of the ground. They sold lots of memorabilia with this logo on. Last day cover, very popular. And... Uh, Finally, squares of turf, of course. Uh, so all of this is coming again under this end of an era brand, uh, celebrating the old stadium and, again, the, establishing this transition to the new one, using the club's history as a way of easing fans into it, you can say. We'll come back to that. Uh, but, of course, also making as much money as possible. And Alan Stevenson, who I referred to then as one of the people leading that project on the commercial team at Huddersfield, went on to do the same at several uh, other clubs, so Bolton, Hull, Coventry, Doncaster, Shrewsbury and Chesterfield. So Chesterfield was in 2010, so you can see from 1994 to 2010 he's working on all these different projects. He did Wembley as well. And it's this pattern that he's established, again, where you have, the, these are the match programmes, you have a big, chunky match programme, you have a load of events all through the season, you talk about the end of an era over and over again, uh, at the final game, you have lots of uh, events, ex-players, ramping up the nostalgia. Uh, and it's this, this quote says, the secret is to try not to rip people off. So you maximise what you can make, but you make sure supporters feel like they've taken part in a historic event. That feels quite cynical to me, um, but I mean, part of it as well is the, the club know this is a one-off opportunity. They will never get this chance again, and they can play on the love that fans have for their club stadium uh, and wanting to be there, wanting to recognise it and uh, buy every bit of merchandise. And as other clubs move stadium as well, uh, through this period, you've got um, Sunderland, Derby, Stoke, Reading, Middlesbrough, Wigan, all of these clubs did similar projects, even though they weren't being led by uh, Stevenson, it was still this pattern with so many moves happening in a short space of time, they took bits from each other, they saw what worked, they copied it and... Uh, all made as much money as possible while also trying to ease this transition from one to the other. And this quote from the Southampton against Arsenal, the final game of the Dell match report in The Guardian, the miniature replica stadium, the photo on the pitch, the souvenir programme, all essential ingredients for a fan who wishes to bid a fond well, a farewell. So it's kind of this, it's established this uh, set of expectations as to how a club should move ground through the whole season, all building up to this final day itself and fans engaging in it. And um, clubs have their own innovations as well. Um, Doncaster had a ceremonial turning out of the lights at the last game of Bellevue, um, which was done by a fan who'd won an auction on eBay. And at Swansea, you could buy something called a Vetchfield box set, 
which had uh, books, a CD of recordings of crowd noise, interviews, stories about the stadium, uh, and a cutting of wood from the stadium as well you got in your Vetchfield box set, so that's lovely. So yeah, you can see that this is all turning into quite an industry, really. But again, the, the, the clubs only get one chance to do it. They're maximising what they can do. And, as you can see in this quote, also from a Guardian match report this time two years later at Manchester City's last game at Main Road, uh, City were not slow to realise that where there is nostalgia, there is brass. And printing 48,000 programmes and selling them at more than double the usual price. Now, the attendance at that last game at Main Road was just under 35,000. So the number of programmes printed was more than the number of people in the stadium. So what we've got is this programme is being sold way beyond the number of people attending that final game and is being used as a, a sort of a, a heirloom, I guess you could say. The idea is that you will pass it down through your family, you will say, I was there, or even I wasn't there, I just went and bought it in the club shop. And this is a, a signifier of that momentous day, uh, the club. But, yeah, also cynicism uh, at the way the club approached it. Um, and the key word there is nostalgia, which we've touched on before. Just a bit of the theory about nostalgia is uh, it's an emotion that comes about at times of change or transitions when you feel a threat to your continuity of identity, that is when you feel nostalgic for home, a yearning for home. Uh, and the disrupt the disruption, so a disruption to your match day routine, uh, where you watch where you watch the football and all of that going, the, the physical act of it being destroyed is a disruption. Individuals must define who they are and where they're going. And I'd say that means fans and the club. Who are they? Where are they going? without the benefit of the tangible support, the physical stadium, that formerly bolstered the intangible understandings of who the club are. Uh, so without the stadium, how do they transfer their identity as a club? And part of that is through what we've seen with the nostalgia-filled programmes, uh, the videos, all of those things, the, the moments on the pitch with the ex-players, this is all contributing to both intangible and tangible ways of transferring nostalgia through heritage, uh, that's enough theory for now. Um, so this is a quote from, we just talked about Man City with their 48,000 programmes. And this is a quote from a report um, on a project about Man City reflecting on the move. And on that final day, the, the review was that fans weren't being given the opportunity to express their own emotions. It was too orchestrated, it was too corporate, the whole season had been building up to this. And when the final game was a bit of a damp squib, they lost 1-0 to Southampton, it poured with rain. They still had a post-match party with some bands on the pitch and the ex-player parade, but it wasn't what the fans wanted at the time. The fans had turned up early, had filled the pubs, had filled the streets to celebrate the ground in their own way, and the club did this stage-managed event, which just fell flat, really. And when they talk in this quote about corporate nostalgia, this is part of what they're talking about. This is, uh, you can see there, there's a logo. Official end of an era partner is the bank first advice. And on the left, it's sort of in a weird sky blue colour, so it's quite hard to read, but it's main road at the top, uh, a computer generated image of the new stadium underneath. And in the middle it says, home is where the heart is. And then in this bit of blurb underneath, uh, which is mostly corporate nonsense, the one line I've pulled out, at first advice, we are as passionate about Manchester City as you are. And this is printed in the, that final programme that sold 48,000 copies on that incredibly emotional day where fans were crying in the stands, uh, having lost the stadium they love. And they're being told by a bank that the bank is as passionate about their club as you are. <laughs> so I think you can see maybe where some of that comes from at the Manchester City Fans. So this is an example of one uh, that fell flat, that didn't work. Well, let's jump ahead. So that was 2003, Man City. And now we're in 2006, and this is probably 
in terms of size of the stadium, Highbury is about 38,000. It's the biggest stadium move that there had been um, in this period we're talking about since 1988. Uh, and how did Arsenal do it? Arsenal, again, ran it through the whole season. Uh, on the left, not come out great, but it's match day themes. They had every match of the season themed, something nostalgic, ex-players, FA Cup, uh, dressing up as orange shirts as Dennis Bergkamp, all linked to things that are important to the fans. Uh, and again, slightly corporate, but more, more linked to the fans rather than maybe some of the negative things that went with the Manchester City one. And here's the running order of the closing ceremony. Um, plenty of events, marching band, parade of legends, trophy parade, Roger Daltrey performing his special song he'd written for the occasion, National Fan. A balloon release, uh, Henry Cooper, uh, who fought at Highbury against Muhammad Ali. Lap of Honor, presentations, countdown of the clocks, fireworks. And they also did a lot of things linking to the new stadium uh, because those who are familiar with the area, Highbury and Emirates are very close, similar to what we saw with Huddersfield. Um, so again, you can continue your match day routine and part of what Arsenal did was showing through these events where they would they had a key that they took from the Emirate from Hydra to the Emirates uh, as a sort of physical representation of going from the off to the new and uh, emphasizing that continuity, uh, that transition between the older. And amid all of these events on this final day was this very important one. <laughs> <laughs> Again, this was printed in the program. So I think that that really helped the fans who are struggling with being the that they got some free monkey nuts with any purchase of a hot dog, but only a hot dog, nothing else. So that's Arsenal in. 2006. And now let's go to where we started um, this talk at Upton Park, which was 10 years later, May 2016. And we saw the pictures earlier of the closing ceremony, uh, which cost a quarter of a million pounds, lasted 45 minutes, fireworks, lasers, ex-players, black cabs, uh, music, the full extravaganza, and the one that everyone watched on telly and spent the whole evening laughing at, basically. But for the West Ham fans, they absolutely loved it. This is a letter that was sent to the Blowing Bubbles fanzine that summer. What an amazing send-off. I know some other clubs felt that the last game was getting too much hype, but quite frankly, it was none of their business. Just because Arsenal hardly did anything to say goodbye to Highbury doesn't mean we were wrong to mark it in our own way. Now, we've just seen that Arsenal did a huge celebration to leave Highbury. It went on all season. They did an absolutely massive thing on the final day. But the West Ham fans think that Arsenal barely did anything. And I think that's the, the difference that 10 years has made here, is that Arsenal in 2006, that ceremony was really only for the people in the stadium. And maybe if you were a, a sort of committed Arsenal fan from afar, you would have seen it covered by the club. But there was a lot less national media coverage. It certainly wasn't live on television anywhere. Whereas 10 years later, West Ham, 2016, it's live on Sky Sports, millions of viewers, and everyone's taking the piss, basically. But the West Ham fans loved it because it's what they got, what they got on with the ramping up the nostalgia uh, he refers at the end to uh, what could have been cheesy. The club got its spot on. Bobby Moore turning the lights out, the perfect way to finish. And top left is what that was. It was a big sort of floating screen hovering above the pitch uh, and a video of Bobby Moore in the number six kit turning out the lights and then all the lights in the stadium went out. Very dramatic. Uh, and then bottom right is a picture of the, all the ex-players lined up on the pitch and more of them getting out of the black cabs at the top. Uh, and yeah, this went on for, yeah, 45 minutes. I think it actually overran, it went on. 
for a long time and yeah, West Ham fans loved it. Um so we've come a long way from Arsenal in 2006. N not so much in terms of the actual extravaganza on the pitch, but in terms of the reaction to it from the worldwide global audience. Uh, and we've come a long way from Scunthorpe in 1988. Uh, and what we've got here is a quote summing up the, uh, the events in The Guardian. All season, the sepia tinted official match programmes have reflected this curious mix of nostalgia and propaganda about a gleaming future in which West Ham and all it means will change beyond recognition. The farewell Berlin rhetoric has been relentlessly packaged and sold back to the fans. Uh, and again, this was a criticism. Although they loved the closing ceremony, the crit there was criticism of, similar to Man City, the way in which it had been corporatised uh, and the way in which it had been branded um, and as we will see the uh, most ridiculous that's a newspaper headline at the top the most ridiculous item of official merchandise at all time this is a foam hand in the shape of the stadium which you can buy for six pounds <laughs> this is a real item I did see it in the club shop at the time Oh, you did buy one? No, I wish I had now, because I, I could have got it out now and done a big <laughs> <laughs> film. So, yeah, we've come a long way from 60p key rings in Scunthorpe, certainly. Um, and a year later, and a few miles up the road, we come to Tottenham. They moved in 2017. And this was an interesting one because, um, if you recall, Tottenham moved to Wembley in between stadiums and the new White Hart Lane is built pretty much on the footprint of the old one, um, which meant there was a lot more, compared to these moves where you're moving to a completely new site, there was a lot more flux over the dates of the move, how the construction was progressing. Um and so Spurs only actually announced a couple of weeks before the final game at White Hart Lane that it would be the final game. Previously, it was thought they might have another year there. But as soon as they announced it, they had their full campaign ready to go. Uh, bottom right, hashtag the lane, the finale. So West Ham's was hashtag farewell Berlin. And this one is the lane, the finale. So again, we're getting increasingly grandiose because they've all got to do something different to the last one. Um, and of course they had the full range of merchandise and they had the massive closing ceremony. Uh, and again, this one was broadcast on Sky Sports, on YouTube, had its social media hashtag. Uh, and this, along with West Ham, is an example of what's called the sort of globalisation of sporting heritage, where they have the expansion of access to broadcasts of sporting events all around the world, plus social media. It's contributed to sport heritage being a sort of global phenomenon that is way beyond the local context of the team uh, and the city that they play in and even the country that they play in. Uh, and again, that's compared to 2006 with Arsenal is something that's massively come on in that time. Um, so we've gone from a time when it was only the fans who were inside the stadium on the final day uh, who were part of the event. So like when we're at Scunthorpe, Walsall, Millwall, it was very much confined to those in the stadium, those who were, you could say committed fans, but then also the attendance doubles perhaps. So it's fans who might only make one or two games a season, but will make the special effort to get to that one. But still it's committed fans of the club uh, who were there for this event. Uh, and then we moved on to a time when the campaign goes on all season. Uh, you have huge programme print runs, so everyone can get a copy, everyone can feel part of this nostalgia sensation uh, around feeling connected to the club and the transition to the new stadium. Uh, and so that involves a wider number of the fan base. And then we come now to this globalised scenario where millions around the world are watching this one opportunity the club have to broadcast their message about who they are. And this is 
kind of what it comes down to is the club are presenting their image um, as their own, her you know, their own heritage. They use nostalgia uh, as a mechanism to show to this global audience that they are the club that you should support. Spurs have this history going back to 1899. You can see from this graphic they used a transition from the old stadium to the new. Uh, they parade all the ex-players. They parade all the trophies they have, um, and it's all it's all part of both for the the committed fans. This sort of reinforces their love for the club and their the idea that they're taking that history with them to the new stadium. So even if it's a characterless old bowl, um, it will still be there with them. Although increasingly, with the example of Spurs, they're building that character into the new stadium. That's what the other half of my PhD is about, basically. Um, and but in, here, that's the new fans. Um, it's saying this is why you should support our club uh, and commit to us. And I think that, that there's that's quite a lot of that in the uh, in this idea of uh, globalization of sports and heritage, which is a whole thing in itself. Um, and again, it's their own message. This is this is not filtered through any other kind of media. The club broadcast the message. It's their own kind of party political broadcast, you could say, about their identity, uh, about who they are, where they're going. Uh, and like we mentioned earlier with the, the quote, um, it's it's a way for that transition of taking it with you and uh, showing everyone that that's, uh, that's your club. Um, they also produced, for these potential fans, something called a finale party toolkit. Uh, so if you're a, if you're not at the game, if you're or if you're a Spurs fan somewhere else in the world, you could download um, your toolkit, and uh, as you say farewell, get your finale party started uh, with a recipe for Tottenham cake and a game to pin the golden cockerel on the top of White Hart Lane. And again, this is the kind of thing that people were laughing at on social media, and or, you know, some Spurs fans also weren't fans of this, but. This is this is the globalization of sporting heritage. This is the club trying to put people in the in the stadium, even though they can't be there physically. This is all part of this this weird thing. And yeah, some some of them don't work. I don't think this really works, but this is kind of the the motivation. Does the does the West does the top and cake collapse then? No, no comment. That's how you bake it. <laughs> so, returning to the first slide, um, with West Ham, you had the fans of other clubs mocking the other day, saying, what's the fuss about with Spurs? Uh, the joke with this one was that they'll be coming back to White Hart Lane in a year's time anyway, so what's all the fuss about? But it's, it's all part of this transition from old to new, using nostalgia and using the story of the club to bring them to the new stadium and ease this transition, that break in the continuity and also bring in new fans to the club. And then more recently, of course, we've had examples of when these campaigns are, are cut short. So this is um, Brentford leaving Griffin Park. And of course, like all the examples we've seen, they had a, they had a hashtag, they had a logo. They started it at the start of the season with this big board at the top left, number of games to go. And half time in every match, they would have a special guest come and change the number, very ceremonial. Uh, they had merchandise, commemorative shirts, they had the logo all over the stadium. Um, but as you'll see from the year 2020, uh, it was the, the last game took place without the, with the fans not knowing that they were at the last game with fans in it. Um, so their last time at Griffin Park, they just didn't know it at the time. And that's in terms of continuity and transition uh, from the old to the new. What we've seen in the other examples is clubs using nostalgia as this way of easing the transition. Whereas here, it gets cut short. They didn't have the chance to do their big closing ceremony and everything they would have wanted to do. And uh, I think that made it harder for some fans to deal with the move because they hadn't had that opportunity to say farewell in the way that they wanted to. Um, 
to sort of ease into it. They they still did things like stadium tours um, in that in that summer of 2020, um, all socially distanced and all that. But it's it's not quite the same, is it? And I think there's there's lots of examples of Brentford fans talking about how difficult they found that, um, especially as this was a season where they uh, they got in the playoffs and they got promoted at a, an empty Wembley again. So it's uh, this is an example of when the transition gets disrupted even more and uh, makes the, the move to the new stadium harder. But I think Brentford again, it wasn't. It's not too far a distance to the new stadium, and uh, I think it was quite fans were quite positive about the move generally. So again, you've got all these sort of competing things that are pulling and pushing uh, of, as to whether fans are going to be easing into the move or not. The level of excitement, the level of how the club are doing. And this is one where it got severely disrupted. And this was the actual final game that took place at the stadium, the playoff semi-final. Uh, so the stadium is empty, of course. Uh, this would have been May or June that year. But the fans still came out and filled the streets outside the stadium. Got the young lad with his mask on. Again, it's that sense of needing to be there, the importance of a club's home, uh, and sense of place, this idea of top affilia, which means love of place, and the, a club stadium is the place where people feel that very strongly, and people feel the need to be there to stand outside uh, on that final game. And what's next? Um, there is another big stadium move coming up in 2025, so end of next season. Everton are going to leave Goodison Park. Um, one of the best stadiums in the country. I really recommend going if you haven't in the next year. Um, and they've already, even though it's more than a year away, they've already announced their creative, which is this in the top right, this logo, uh, and using the, the lines either side of Parker uh, relate to the Archibald Leach frontage on the stand, which you can see in the image below. So already a year in advance, they've got their brand They've mocked up this merchandise, the flag, the book, the scarf. Uh, the book in the top left is a presentation box that season ticket holders can add to their season ticket for next season. 65 quid and you get a personalised book uh, with some stuff in it. Um, but again, it's, it's all part of making this an event, uh, ramping up the nostalgia. It'll be full of photos of the club's history and all things like that. Uh, and I think it's really interesting how this one is going to go, um, again, as a, a hugely historic stadium and maybe quite a... I think Everton fans have kind of come to terms with the move um, and I'm very interested to see how this next year plays out with Everton. And the quote from the, uh, from the website, the brand will continue to evolve... Uh, telling the closing chapter of the Good and Story. Again, it's all very corporate, uh, but again, they're trying to ramp up this sense of home and help ease the transition with the new stadium. Uh, so yeah, that is how you say goodbye to a stadium, uh, how you mark the end of an era, and that's the end of this talk. Thank you very much. <laughs>1994 and at half time um, the chairman at the time walked on the pitch uh, it was Jim Hill and said it wasn't the last game <laughs> so they sold the programmes, they've done all this nonsense and then guess what, they stayed exactly where they were um, <laughs> there you go. anyway thank you for your once again, that was really really good it, um, anybody have any questions perhaps so thanks Ian, that, that was great I just wonder um Speaking to a load of fans, and you heard, you know, quite rightly, that if, if, if we ever decided to, uh, to to move, people were going to block, blockade the, the chairman's driveway, quite rightly. Um, <laughs> and, but, and, and you talked about some that were done well and took the fans with them and others that didn't. But I wonder if any of them have not been successful. In the end, we are fans, and I guess that we move. You know, and, and for those where there were protests, 
where there was negativity. Have you done any analysis of what happened next? It's a great question. Yeah, and uh, I think the, the one that immediately jumps to mind is West Ham, um, where I think if the, the new stadium was obviously not, not really their home, it was, they were you know, moving into the Olympic Stadium, it, it was sort of forcing them into that non-football stadium. And the fans didn't accept it, they protested, there were people running on the pitch in that next season. Um, there was a famous, I think the guy ran and grabbed the corner flag and slammed it in the centre spot of one game. Um, when they were 3-0 down to Burnley, something like that. Um, and yeah, there were quite strong protests there. And uh, I think it was kind of through the final season at West Ham, there were those rumblings of protest um, because the fans weren't happy about it. But then when they moved, it was even worse than they imagined. Um, just, I mean, they've, they've slightly improved it now by changing some of the physical things in the stadium, like squaring off the ends, making it more of a football stadium. And they've added things around it that make it more West Ham. So they've, they've got uh, images around the stadium, they've got their name on it, which they didn't have for the first year. Uh, they've got statues, things like that. Um, but I think most West Ham fans would still say it's not their home. Their home is uh, the site of the old ground. And, uh, and I think, you know, some, some of them will still, it's quite a few miles away, but they will still drink in the pubs around the old ground and make the journey to the new one because it's about continuing that match day routine and they haven't found what they want in the new one. So, yeah, that, that's the one immediately that, that springs to mind as having uh, not worked for the fans. And I think it's, it's getting there and the fact they've, they've won a trophy in the last few years and, and they, they're slightly better than they were when they first moved in, but that's the one that hasn't worked. And, uh, 2016 was the move. By the way, Theo, when you mentioned Huddersfield Town, the entire, the entire table left. <laughs> <laughs> but I do think they didn't realise what was going on. Thanks very much for the talk. Um, I just wanted to give more of a comment and a question, a different perspective. I was on a Man City fan and I was at the last main road game. I've got one of the 48,000 programmes. Um, so it just felt a bit slightly unfair, I thought, from like you have been at the game. It was deflating, but I think that was because we were crap at the time of the <laughs> city. It was pouring down. Um, I don't really know what else, how it differed from some of the others. The bands were playing, the fireworks were there, and um, you, could, you could buy a souvenir program. Kind of thing. So I didn't quite get why that was portrayed as being a stable, inverted commas, again, compared to the others. I think with that, it's, it, it, it's, it's more that that was reported on as how it had been reacted to. But I think there are, I wouldn't say that every single one of those ceremonies was a success either. There are, I mean, there's Hull, uh, there, theirs was also just fell flat. Again, they lost the game, but it, it, it wasn't even so much that. I think fans, again, there's, there was a sense of um, not wanting to leave. And uh, it, it's, 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 it's maybe the, the reports that, that have, come out of those various games. Man City was one where they really stood out as there being quite a negative atmosphere around it. But I, I certainly don't think they're the only ones where uh, the ceremony has, you know, the, the club have tried to put on this ceremony and, and the fans just aren't interested because the fans want to say goodbye to the stadium in their own way, um, which was what sounded like happened at Man City where fans turned up and had their, had their own sort of goodbye to the stadium, turned up early, filled the streets. Um, and I think it, it was maybe just the, the contrast of that with the, the bands on the pitch when fans were really just wanting to do their own thing. Um, but yeah, so, certainly, I'm not sure there's a, anywhere the... Uh, I mean, it's, it's kind of interesting that the West Ham quote is saying how great the ceremony was uh, when there are other ones that seem to fall flat as well, but there aren't really those quotes out there. It's, uh, yeah, it's, it's interesting how it's changed over time as to... Maybe because that West Ham one was social media as well, there was more people talking about it. Whereas the Man City one, it was, it was sort of through the prism of um, newspaper reports and things like that, and that City and Community report that was quite scathing about it. Um, but yeah, it's it's interesting to see the differences. But yeah, I'm, I'm not I'm not sure it's I'm really not sure it's just Man City that that was the case. At all. Cheers for that. Um, 
Do, are you aware of anyone that's done a similar level of study for teams that have left their grounds because they've gone out of business? I mean, we've got Park Avenue that's still in living memory. Um, <laughs> there is a book out there written by Chris and myself. Yeah, about but the book. Yeah, it's not, it's, not, it's not just. A, but it's not just. A, what about all? You know, yeah, I'm but sure. it's I'm all sure. the other clubs. You know, a lot of clubs have gone out of business. Not recently, but Maidstone, I think, is the latest one. You know, is there any study of uh, the traumatic effect of losing your ground and your club? Yeah, I've not come across anything looking into that. Um, yeah, it's it's. It's interesting with that because you've got the cl some clubs form Phoenix clubs and so they sort of channel they channel the the hurt and the anger and the sadness into that. Um, but yeah, there are certainly clubs that have just completely disappeared and uh, you know, uh, uh, something like Third Lanark would be fascinating to see the response to to when that happened in Glasgow. Um, yeah, I've, I've not seen anything looking into that. Well, thank you, Fiona. Um, that's probably one of our best engagements afterwards, so well done to you. Obviously raise a lot of questions. And by the way, Glenn, there is a book about Bradford Park Avenue. <laughs> by Chris and myself, I didn't plan on. Um, yeah, thanks for that, it's fantastic. It, um, it, does, it, it really struck me that if Bradford City decided to move at the end of this season, good luck selling the pitch. Um, <laughs> That's a book here, Sam, for two pounds or like that, I don't know. Uh, brilliant. So our next um, talk is on the 6th of April. It's Peter Chimera come back from the Ukrainian Bantams. Uh, Peter talked to us about the duality of being a uh, Bradford City supporter, but up in the Ukrainian descent being brought up in Bradford, and also supporting uh, Dinamo Kiev and the Ukrainian national team. It's coming back now to talk about the impact of the war on Ukrainian football, which will be really, really interesting again. We've had coups in Chile and now we're having war in Europe. And we always like to lighten the mood before matches. And finally, <laughs> I can make an announcement that the, our famous bus trips uh, are coming back. So remember we had an open top bus trip of a sewage works. Um, this time we're doing any old iron, the iron works and coal mines of Bradford. It'll be a run round the very back end, I don't know, said arson, but I will say back end of Bradford, uh, some up in East Bradford. Uh, 25th of May, tickets will be going on sale probably in the next week or two, and watch Keith's social media post for that. So thank you again, Fiona. Thank you.